Hello, we are at Agile Adria 2015. My name is Marco Keba, and I have the privilege to be talking to Tom Gilp, the Agile Grandpa. Uh, now, Tom, you've written numerous books. I took uh, a look, nine books. Uh, the ones with the most prints, software metrics, software inspection, principles of software engineering management. Uh, you have uh, worked with uh, multiple companies. You somehow prefer the big ones. and uh, They're richer. They're richer, <laughs> yeah. Large-scale system engineering stuff. And uh, the, the interesting, thing, interesting thing is that uh, uh, you were there from the very, very beginnings. So the... Evo method has developed by you has been there way, way before people think that Agile uh, actually started. You know, somehow we are always thinking about the 90s and you know the multiple methods in the 90s meeting together and forming this new uh, world in uh, in the 2000s. And uh, now we are hearing something like uh, 1970s, which is like 20 years earlier. So That's when we started publishing results of many years' experience about it. Okay, so in the 1970s we started publishing stuff that was happening before. Yes. So how, how did it all start, I mean, okay. with the EVO method? Yeah, well, actually, I prefer to, to see my EVO method is not the same as other Agile methods at the same time. And I think it's better to take the broader perspective, okay? Okay. So uh, I started doing what we would now call Agile, that is, a delivery of an IT system in 20 increments of value delivery in 1960 on an invoicing project for an Oslo clothing manufacturer. 1960. Yeah. 1960. Now, I was 20 years old. <clears throat> I did not go on any courses or any conferences. It, for me, it was just common sense. Do a little good stuff. Check that it's good. If not, change it. If it is, do more good stuff until all good stuff is delivered. So I call this, uh, in other words, the method uh, uh, I would call uh, intelligent common sense. Okay, common okay. sense says you don't do gigantic things and fail, uh, and and you do a little bit at a time, and you try to prove that things are not just done or built, but when you have to transfer them to a user of some kind or stakeholder and make sure that they are happy too, and when they are happy, value is delivered, then move on, build more. That was my method, but it's pure, let's call it intuition, is another word for intelligent common sense. Why should we do anything otherwise? Now, here's the thing. At the same time, uh, we, we didn't, you know, we, we had very small computers. Like, my first com proper computer was an IBM 1401. That means 1K of memory for all programs and data in the primary CD memory. Okay? So we had small programs and small projects, okay? We didn't have big projects. <laughs> it didn't exist. We just coded something and it went on the air the next day, practically. So okay. you, you were a programmer on the project that, that you mentioned? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I was a programmer for 20 years. Okay. Uh, uh, in fact, before I was a programmer, in 58, I was a plug board plugger because all the early computers even had plug boards for things like printer functions. You didn't program them. You plug them. And these were, these were technologies from the 30s, these printers uh, we used. It. Punched card readers were used in early computers. Okay. So you had to plug them. Yeah, so I began as a plug board specialist on punch card in 58. By 60, we had proper electronic computers and were programming them in uh, assembler language, essentially. Um, but, uh, so, but this is the situation for everybody. We had small-scale stuff. People uh, didn't do projects. They wrote code and systems suddenly were more or less working. So uh, I, I would say everybody at that time was um, agile and evolutionary. Again, w w when people say agile today, they really mean you do it in cycles or sprints. Mm -hmm. they, that's what they really mean, what it boils down. It doesn't mean you're having a stand-up be this. The essence of all uses of that word agile are doing things in small cycles and incrementing. Okay. okay. Yeah. Everybody was doing that. You're compared talking, to, I'm sorry, compared to doing a big project with... There was no big front. projects. Uh, there uh, were, when you say people mean Agile as incremental and iterative compared to... That was just the, the way we programmed and built systems. Okay. Uh, even in early days, we had a wonderful little thing uh, on the IBM 1401, which was a, um, it was a Fortran interpreter. And we could compile in about one minute the whole thing. So we could do very fast one-minute iterations of the logic and see how it worked. 
I'm sorry, j just for, okay. for, for the matter of discussion, was there, was there others that were not doing it that way? Or was it just intuitive I, for you to... Uh, okay, it, largely, almost, uh, what I was trying to say, almost everybody approached it this way. Okay. I, 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 you ask any old programmer, did you do a little bit of programming and put it in there, see if it worked that day and do a little bit more? Uh, the answer, I think everybody would say they were doing that. That was how we worked. The that idea, was intuitive for yeah, you? Yeah, it, well, it, you know, you had a, a little task and it, uh, most of it could be done in a day or so and or a few days and you just did it. So, so we were doing cycles. Of the, our cycles were often, you know, we had to compile. Sometimes uh, early COBOL programs could take an hour to compile. That's why it was so sensational. You could get Fortran uh, interpretation within 30 seconds. So we could take shorter cycles. Okay, but a long cycle was an hour of compiling, and then you could try it out. But still, we could do many uh, trials in a day, which begins to le look like uh, um, um, uh, uh, lean, lean uh, startup, which is doing okay. 50 or 60 things per day. We were doing that. Yeah. Everybody was. It was just the working environment we're in. Now, as you, uh, the only exceptions were like IBM itself had gigantic projects with staffed by hundreds of people called they called the Chinese Army, and they were building the new operating systems for the IBM 360 and compilers. So they were gigantic projects, and these are the things that Fred Brooks wrote about in his book Mythical Man Month, things like that, where he was looking at the first really big projects, and there were some early military projects using agile methods, okay? Um, the, um, uh, Craig Larman did some wonderful tracing back from practices in the 70s at IBM Federal Systems Division under Hardin Mills called Clean Room. Anybody can Google Clean Room. This was doing 2% increments of delivery to st stakeholders and users and measuring what happened and learning and changing. This is agile. This when is, was that? This was from 1970 to 1980, when it was first reported in IBM Systems okay. Journal number 4, 1980. But what Craig Larma did, he took that for me, the first I'd ever heard of anybody else doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, mind, It was 10 years after I was doing it, but the first time I'd heard of anybody else doing it. But we weren't in, on a network. We didn't have very good communication. Lots of, lots of agile was being done in parallel, unknown to everybody. We just didn't have an internet and we didn't have conferences. Okay, So we didn't communicate. <laughs> but everybody's doing it. What Craig Larman did, he went to the uh, clean room people, Harlan Mills and Robert Quinn and others, and he said, where did you get these ideas from? And they pointed backwards, back to the early rocket projects, the Mercury projects, the X-15 projects, and things like that. So, uh, in other words, uh, all the early projects uh, from did this even in a hardware way, and then they started getting more and more software. So they did the hardware, so the software incrementally. Okay, so uh, so they literally passed on this custom of doing small increments of uh, and uh, a value uh, to uh, uh, the group at IBM Federal Systems Division, who did the large scale, very large military and space projects, such as the LAPS project for ships and the space shuttle ground software, which were big projects. But they were done in uh, let's call it two percent increments. A four year project had monthly increment. Each increment was delivered on board a ship for real sailors to try. Now, these were not, we tested it, so we hope it works. These were, does it give the sa time saving or accuracy of shooting or whatever the, uh, uh, the, the uh, user needed. Okay. And these projects, like the Clean Room Project, this is described in IBM System Journal number 4, 1980, Hardin Mills, uh, which you can find on the internet if you look. <clears throat> they managed to deliver the highest quality Military and space is high quality, right? Fixed deadline, determined sometimes by the position of the planets, right? Mm -hmm. God waits for no man to be laid on a deadline. Lowest bidder price contracts, they got them delivered always on time, always under budget for 10 years. That's what they reported in 1980. So this is perfect complex software project management using what we today would recognize as Agile. But they didn't call it Agile, they called it Clean Room. Okay, so if, if I understand what you're saying, you said that there were multiple people or multiple organizations that were doing almost the same thing, yeah. not conferencing about it, so not That's knowing right. about each other. Yeah, largely not knowing. So I'll give another example. In my book uh, from 1988, 
principles of software engineering management. That's the one all the agile manifesto signers say, we read that and we like the idea of doing things mm -hmm. in cycles. Thank you very much, Tom. That's why I'm the grandfather. Okay. There is a chapter in that book, which I'll send to anyone who wants it electronically. It's, uh, it's called Deeper Perspectives on Evolutionary Delivery. I take what we know as Agile today, small cycle delivery. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, part A is all about the software people who were doing it, like Professor Victor Basili at University of Maryland, Stonebaker, and all kinds of really good, uh, today sometimes fairly famous old timers. They were doing it. Then uh, part B is in the hardware engineering industry, and part C is in uh, science and biology. It turns out that methods of this kind were, had, were being done uh, hundreds of years ago. Uh, you can start with a guy like René Descartes in his decomposition to understand problems. You can go back to uh, 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 the Chinese, uh, 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 I think it's Cao, Tao, the Tao anyway, that speaks about building systems one brick at a time, one step at a time, the Great Wall of China. You know, this is ancient Chinese philosophy to do things one step at a time, to build really big things like the first man-made structure, the wall, that can be seen from space. Not to mention the Chinese dynasty, which is doing just fine right now, it turns out. So, so how did it all, if it, we're talking about the 70s now, and, yeah. and stuff being, uh, as you explained... The 70s was like a clean room, was the dominant thing we know about today, where they were doing this and succeeding. They were doing something different from Agile today. You see, the Agile uh, manifesto guys who popularized this mm -hmm. made one very bad mistake, and I've told them all personally. They forgot, they, 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 they had the idea of doing, instead of Big Bang, we'll write all the code and then we'll deliver it. They said, we'll, we'll write the code and we'll check it out, make sure it has no bugs, has the right functions in small increments, and we'll hope that if we burn down the burn down chart, we'll have delivered the user stories and the user will get value. But they forgot to address value. Value are things like the, uh, uh, the user friendliness of the system, these are qualities, the security of the system, okay? the performance of the system. And uh, uh, the Agile manifesto totally failed to address performance, cost, and quality at all. They're just addressing functionality. So they are, if you like, the Agile as we know it today is basically a thing to speed up the coding at greater velocity. That's what a person like Jeff Sutherland emphasized, 10 times the velocity. But the problem is it may be 10 times the velocity of bad stuff and irrelevant stuff. Okay, okay. Ten, 10 times faster junk is still junk. And what we need to do is shift our focus, and we're still, uh, even, even Jeff Sutherland, even at the Agile in Poland, uh, made a remark that amused me greatly, and I told him so. He said, without Scrub, we have total failure rate of IT projects 40%. With Scrub, we only fail 19% of the time. And I find this highly amusing. What about, like, Clean Room, decades earlier, 0% of the time? I think IT projects, if done properly, if they focus on values and costs, not just functionality of code, <coughs> I think they can do exactly like Clean Room and all of my clients do with Evo and have zero failure. So you're saying that the failure, actual failure of whatever, 19% or 40 or 50% is coming from doing the wrong things, not from That's doing right. them... That's right. Failure the right is very way. simple to define. Failure means that the values of the key stakeholders were not satisfied. Therefore, they refused to use your product or take it into use or pay for it or something like that. So it could be a failure to be user-friendly enough. I, there are some products like my Pebble watch, I just laugh at. You've got to be kidding. It's so user unfriendly, it's incredible. But I bought it anyway while waiting for my Apple watch, which I know is fantastically user friendly, but I had to wait a long time to get it. You know, it's, it's like the old difference between a Nokia telephone and an iPhone, which changed the world a little bit, okay? So uh, consumers will go where it's user friendly and secure and cheap and fast, okay? And if you don't satisfy those things, your product, service, or product will fail. And we are terrible. I mean, the Agile community doesn't even mention the word stakeholder. They think they're being good boys by focusing on customer and user. But you know, there are about 48 other stakeholders in any other project, like European law for privacy. Okay? So we, uh, we need to, when I train people to, to think about this, I said, you must first think about the stakeholder picture. These are all instances that have requirements that you must respect or you die. And okay. user and, and customer are very important, but they're only a small part of the picture. So you have to get a hold of, for example, uh, somebody who might review your product, may n never use it, 
and never buy it, but they will review it. If they give it a bad review, nobody will buy it. So right. You have to satisfy what a reviewer is going to look for, to take an example in marketing. Okay? And there are lots of these instances out there that you have to figure out, what do I have to do so my product succeeds or my service succeeds? <coughs> and we're very bad. It's called this uh, business analysis or requirements analysis. We're extremely, we think requirements are things like user stories and use cases, and they are not. The biggest and most important requirements are the critical values of the critical stakeholders. And this is something the current Agile doesn't even try to address, I'm afraid. So we're not, not addressing They're the, not even the thinking values. about it. They're not even thinking about thinking about it. They're not even denying that they should think about it. The problem with Agile as we know it, if, if you boil it down, it's largely a programming discipline for programmers to make coding go faster. Fine. But what about controlling those things that determine success and failure with the whole thing? And that's just not being managed. There's a vacuum there, literally a vacuum. Therefore, even Scrum has, according to Jess Sutherland, a 19% failure rate. Okay? Now, that's pretty bad when the failure rate, if you're satisfying your stakeholders, the failure rate should be close to zero. That's what we as a community have to aim for, zero failure of projects. We are serving businesses and society, just talking to a man who's doing health systems in Croatia here. You know, we can't have failed health systems killing people because IT people can't get it straight. You know, these have to be nurse friendly, okay? They have to be highly secure. They have to be almost bomb proof in, in war, to take another example. Highly, highly robust and things like that. And we're not even thinking, there is no idea of architecture or design or quality in the Agile Manifesto style of things like Scrum, XP, etc. Uh, the people developing this admit that. They don't deny it. They admit in principle we should be doing it. They're thinking of it, but it's not happening. Okay, okay. And, and the actual developers that you have mentioned, uh, uh, the, the talk that you have given today yes. was power to the programmers. Okay, so, so part two of our... What, what, what does that mean? What does it mean okay. and why is what, this what, smart? What I, what I found is, is that uh, uh, I've been observing things for about 55 years. And I've observed managers and architects trying to determine, you know, what are the goals of the project, what is the architect of the project, and then it gets programmed for five years. Okay? And long story short, it, this always fails. And there are observers like Tom Peters, the management consultant, who's been observing for decades that the big projects always fail, including all the big IT projects. You only have to key into Google failed IT projects to get about 70 million hits. Okay, so we are notorious, and everybody in public knows it for our failure rate. We should be ashamed. Uh, when I was young, we used to be proud. I'm a programmer. You know? Say so today, so, oh yeah, so that's the one who, the health system or the anti-terror system was six years late and everybody died. You, you know, uh, we, are, we are a scandal, we are a shame. You know? We should be normally succeeding in getting things done on time, under cost, to the right quality levels. We should be proud that we have delivered good stuff to society. We don't even have that ideal, and I'd like to suggest the ideal to the listeners. You know, you should be in the business of succeeding and delivering useful value to society. That's the job. If you merely want to be a coder, go away. Okay? Uh, you, you want to help society with IT systems, software systems, have that as your highest ideal. Whatever I do, whether I code or don't code, what my, my software hardware system will deliver value to the society, the business and the citizens. So, so is the failure tied to the programmers not having the power? Is that what the problem okay, is? Okay, so back to that. <coughs> so part one was, uh, there was a lot of dictation from the top. By, you know, I'm a manager, I want that. Uh, uh, I, I'm the architect, you will do it this way. So what we found through time is that these methods failed. Okay, so part two, uh, we observed instances uh, where, uh, for example, uh, by doing the defect prevention process in 1980 at IBM, Robert Mays, which I cited in my talk, uh, he delegated power to the programmers to analyze their own bugs and analyze the root causes of the bugs. Who was doing it before? Who? Who was doing it before? He uh, ma managers, directors, outside consultants. 
Okay. Anybody but the programmers. Okay. They were just told what to do. Accenture or somebody would come in and say, here's a whole new organization thing, charge $50 million. It would never work. But the director said, we have paid all this money from these wise consultants, so you are going to do this. Programmers totally powerless. They were just slaves told what to do. You will do agile. You will do lean. You will do whatever was popular. Okay. So the programmers had no say in it, largely. Okay. Now, what, what happened was, in, the, in 1980, uh, Robert uh, Mays uh, figured out that if we delegate the dis analysis and decision-making to the people who cause the bugs or wrong requirements or something like that, the, the troops, grassroots, if they analyze what's wrong, two things will happen. Uh, number one, they will get it right. They made the mistake and they know why. Managers have no idea. The outside consultants from Accenture have no idea. They're just too far away from the troops, okay? So, so he got the right people analyzing. Then he got the, uh, uh, the right people deciding what to do. You see, an outside consultant will suggest something very expensive that they'll earn a huge profit on, okay? okay. But the, 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 the programmer won't do that. They'll suggest things like, if I'm tired, I shouldn't come to work until I've slept enough. Simple things like that, you know? If, if there are disturbances uh, in my work environment, I should have a private office. They'll decide simple little things like that that make them productive. So it turns out whatever the programmers suggest will probably be accepted and desired by all the programmers. Whatever the managers and outside consultants suggest, there's another agenda there. They will never, for, so for example, at uh, IBM in Minnesota, in a 10-year period, they had almost 1,822 process changes. This is not one big idea. This is 1,822 small changes that have big leverage and big effect. One change may prevent 10,000 bugs. And the one change just might be a slight improvement to a training course for all the thousands of new employees. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in other words, uh, by delegating, uh, things got practical, realistic insight. And actually, the, the programmers love this. It's, it's a fun job to take a little break from the coding and the testing to, to analyze why are we committing so many bugs? And it's, it's almost like a, a nice little puzzle. You know, some like Sudoku, like my wife, and I, I like solving problems like why are these bugs occurring? Finding the common cause, the root cause. Okay? I like thinking of an idea that might cure it and trying it out and see if it works. And we empower the programmers to even try out the ideas themselves and see if it works. And if it works, spread it to the corporation or something like that. Meaning by changing the system that produced it in the first place. Exactly. Okay. But what we're doing is we're, we're killing off the root cause. See, a root cause could be uh, that they're improperly trained, or they don't have a tool, or they don't have enough time, or whatever it is. But the root cause, uh, the, the thing about a root cause, it's a root cause of a commonly occurring uh, uh, error. That is, there are thousands of them. And in a large organization of 10,000 programmers, every programmer may do this 50 times a year. So if you can find the root cause in one day and make a change and figure out how to get rid of it, you've just saved thousands and thousands of bucks, for, for example. And managers don't operate at that level of thought at all. They want to buy a big package from a big company. You know, okay, five-year program to go lead. That's exactly what some of the top executives do. So everybody has to go to lean course and everybody plays the game. But, uh, you know, to, to try and get some quantified results from all this effort of agile and lean. Uh, lean a little better than agile. Agile has almost nothing good to say for itself. I asked just one hour ago, one person here from Croatia, if uh, he's doing a lot of agile at a large company in Croatia, and I said, can you give me some numbers for what has happened and what has improved? And the simple answer was, no, we don't collect the data. Okay. Yeah, in other words, you're doing something at great expense, but uh, nobody can say what the value is because they're not even bothering to measure. In fact, they didn't even have a clear idea before they started what they should be improving numerically. So they have no agenda to measure that they're getting what they didn't ask for. They are buying things like Agile on, as a religious faith thing. <coughs> Do Agile, life will be better. Uh, Meaning we were not measuring value before we started it, we are not well, measuring value you see, as we are doing it. If you're pushing somebody and say, oh, but we are measuring the value, it's going faster. And it is. And you can measure that, okay? But the, but the project failure rate, uh, well, yes, we're measuring that. We only have half the project failure rate. Only half of our patients die now, you know? Uh, but what about observing that long ago, in a time far away, 
on a planet such as this in 1970s and before, people were having zero defect projects in large-scale software. They were delivering very high quality, military and space quality, on time, by the deadline, below the budget, no project overruns. That's what Clean Room was doing, okay? And similar agile projects were doing that. Uh, and, and so we, we knew how to get, get zero defect in, in project delivery and success. Well, but I asked people, have you ever heard of these methods like DPP and Clean Room? Nobody in the room raised their hand in my lecture today except one man, Ben Linders, who of course has studied these things for years and is one of our lecturers at the conference. Okay. Okay, but, but so what, somehow what people forgot the history. And as Santayana said, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So we are repeating the early history of failures that caused people to develop these agile methods in the 70s and before. We have totally forgotten what we learned. Why does this happen? Do not, do not, do not we write it down? It was written down in IBM System Journal 1980, for example. So it's written. Well, it wasn't quite on the internet for a while. Okay. Uh, shouldn't professors at universities be teaching these things? No. Why not? Because they never got taught. They never did it. There's a total breakdown in communication of what has worked well in the past, which is why, and, and there are very few people like me, I'm 74 years old, okay, I started at 17, and I'm still going strong, right? The other guys are retired, so they know this stuff, but they're retired. So they're, they're, they're not teaching, they're, they're, they're not consulting, they're not managing, they've gone. So the, the wisdom, uh, the chief medicine man and chief of the tribe have left, and all the young braves are there, uh, going out fighting stupid wars and getting all killed because they haven't learned how to make peace or something like that. But the other tribes. So it is learning that is failing, basically. It is, yeah. We know how to uh, succeed in both a zero defect quality. Clean room was about zero defect quality, full stop. That's why it's called clean room. Okay? Clean room also happened to deliver on time, under budget, all qualities that the military and space were asking for. We have known how to do this on a large scale, publicly published 1980, practiced since 1970, but nobody in the room has ever heard of this. Of course, they weren't even born in 1980. I had a subscription to IBM System Journal, and I later met Harlan Mills and the gang, got to know them personally. I, I know what happened, because I was alive. That's why you need grandfathers and old medicine men and people like that to remind you of what we have already learned the hard way. Okay, thank you very much, Grandpa, for my, reminding us of that. My pleasure. Now go out there and make the projects better. Huh? Okay, thank you. <laughs>